Welcome to another edition of Play It Throw, and this time around it's Ninja Gaiden 2, The Dark Sword of Chaos, brought to us by Tecmo. Now this is the second game in the Ninja Gaiden trilogy on the NES, and it does what I think a good sequel should. It includes most of the same core gameplay from the first game, but it gives you a brand new story, and improves some of the faults the first game has. Now just like the first Ninja Gaiden game, this game is very much story driven with very elaborate, drawn-out cutscenes that have great artwork and an interesting story that keep you involved in the game, that it makes you want to play the next level, even with all the cheap deaths, even with the tough enemies, you want to keep playing, you want to keep trying to see how the story is going to progress. Now, just like the run of the first Ninja Gaiden game I did, through a lot of the cutscenes, I will kind of, you know, quiet down my talking of the game, and just let you read and enjoy the storyline and comment uh, throughout it. Now, this is the opening to Ninja Gaiden 2. The first one started off with the great duel between uh, Ryu's father, Ken, uh, that ended up, you know, him losing the duel and thinking that he's dead. But if you saw my run on Ninja Gaiden 1, you know that he survives the duel and actually comes back to, to face Ryu later on under mind control. And then Ryu ends up saving him, but still in the end, Ryu's father sacrifices himself to protect Ryu and ends up dying in the end anyway. Now, basically, this main storyline of this game goes, you have this new evil force, this new evil force named Ashtar, who is going to open up the Realm of Chaos, this gate that seals the Realm of Chaos, using this uh, evil sword, the Dark Sword of Chaos, like in the title of the game, and uh, pretty much release all these demons and all this evil over the world. So, similar to the first game where you're getting, the, you have these two statues that can resurrect a great demon, this one... He wants to do it a little bit more, you know, drawn out, much bigger scale of a final battle. He wants to open up a gate to unleash all these demons. So instead of just one, he has the potential to release tons and millions and how many, who knows how many exact demons that he's going to bring out of the Realm of Chaos. Now, just like that says right there, this is one year after the first Ninja Gaiden game takes place. Now, to start off this game, we find out that Ryu's girlfriend or love interest from the first game, Irene, has been kidnapped, and now Ryu is has to, of course, now find her, wants to save her, so he needs to find out some information first. So that starts off Act 1. Here is Level 1-1, and you can see that the game graphically is almost an exact representation or duplicate of the first Ninja Gaiden game. The gameplay is changed slightly. We have some new abilities, not all the same abilities from the first one do return, but we have some new ones, including the ability to create a double of Ryu, uh, that kind of works as like an exact clone. It's an orange clone. You can actually get up to two of them. And we'll see that probably in the second level. I should be able to get the first uh, upgrade for that. And I'll be able to keep it throughout the rest of the game. The biggest thing they changed in terms of gameplay, and I liked it, you know, that's the best thing about the game, is that you can scale any wall. Now right now I am climbing down a ladder, which makes sense for you to be go able to go up and down it. But now you can climb up any wall in the game. So it really helps you make certain jumps. Now here is the first boss of the game. Just like the first one when you had like four henchmen working for uh, the main boss, we have the Tribesmen of Chaos, another group of four. Now this one is Dando the Cursed, the first member of the group, and similar to the first boss of the, of the first Ninja Gaiden game, very easy. Harder than the, you know, than the first boss, but very easy as well. He comes at you a little bit, you can hit him a bunch of times, and then he's going to charge at you, so you want to jump over him, he'll hit the wall, you can attack him some more, He'll repeat charging over and over again until you take him out. And here we go with actually the first part of cutscenes throughout the game. So we went ahead to this place to find out about Irene, where Irene is, and we end up running into this new character who tells us where to go. He informs us that we now have to uh, go to the Tower of Leja or Laja, uh, to find Irene. So just like Ryu, we are confused, we're not quite sure who this guy is, whether or not he's actually helping us, or whether or not he's setting us up for a trap, but we're gonna go there anyway. So here is Act 2, we're on a series of trains, it's 
one of those things that there's a, a train level in a lot of games, and they all work kind of the same way, especially on, on the NES, or if not a train, a moving car level, like, for example, Bad Dudes. Uh, when you're working on the tops of cars, no problem, the wind doesn't knock you off, there's, you know, usually in a lot of these games, there's some kind of obstacle, usually some kind of sign flying at your face to knock you off, but we don't have to deal with that, just some annoying enemy spawns that we have to take care of, including the weird little walking flea-esque men, uh, bats, eagles, and the Jason guys who chase us with a machete, an exact uh, enemy form of Jason. I now have my first duplicate form, uh, my first clone, who, as you can see, jump does the exact same thing I do. But if I stop and stand still, and I can actually use this to my advantage in certain parts, of uh, being able to, if I stop, I can uh, go ahead and just keep swiping. If he's above, like if I'm below and he's above me, we can both hit an enemy from above and below, both swinging at the same time. Because he mimics exactly what I'm doing. If that made, I hope that made at least a little bit of sense. Now this is Act Two, Part Two, and the cool thing about this level, as you can see, it's like gimmick for this level, is the wind. You have to watch the wind in order to make certain jumps, or if you try to make a certain jump with the wind blowing you backwards, you just end up not being able to make it far enough and you end up falling right down into one of the chasms, the instant deaths. So that's always fun, plus of course you're dealing with all the great enemies that you have to fight as well. After, when we get to the end of this level, we'll have to deal with the next boss, the Baron Spider boss, a member of the Tribesmen of Chaos. And he's an overall pretty easy boss, here he is. Now he throws spiders at us, and if you climb up to attack him, he ends up jumping right down. I suggest having the fire wheel, the fire throwing ability, throw all them at him as you can. And then it comes down to just when you, you know, a long drawn out battle, waiting for him to throw spires and climb up quickly, try to get a jump attack him, you know, when he's still on the top platform, or jump straight down to the bottom platform and get some hits in, then repeat the process. He'll, once you're on the bottom, on the ground, he'll jump back up to the platform, dodge spiders, climb up, and then jump at him to attack. Now, during that cutscene, we learned a little bit more about our main goal. We learned about Ashtar, uh, the main leader of this group. These are the Tribesmen of Chaos. So we finally find out a little bit more information about them as we enter now uh, Act Number 3. Ryo, of course, is now determined to find Irene. And he looks up on top of the mountain that we climbed. And you can see our main goal, the Tower of Lejah, or Lija, all the way in the background, where we will now start to head. So here we go with Act Number 3, Part 1, and in this level, the kind of gimmick you want to call for this level, like the wind of the previous level, is you can't see the ground unless the lightning flashes. Or, you can kind of see the ground, but you may not know always when the best time is to uh, jump. Now, on some of the platforms, you can easily tell where a platform is because you can see that the background kind of gets cut off. Uh, by certain, you know, jumps that you're going to make. On the, some platforms, like this one right here, since the platform is so low, you have to kind of wait for the lightning, or repeat over and over again the same area to know exactly where to jump. And even then, sometimes, it can be tricky, especially when you're landing on a singular platform. To any platformer, uh, like Mario or such, when you have that one space to land on, is always a pain to get to. Now this is 3-2, a pretty simple, straightforward level, not any kind of special gimmicks. This is where it starts to come into uh, the making the jumps with enemies already on the platform. Kind of a broad spectrum of title, but that's a problem with all the guiding games on the NES, is, is these certain platforms you have to jump to and the enemies are waiting for you. Anyone that shoots a projectile like the gun guys or throws something at you, is uh, learning the timing, either jump really quickly and attack him before he has the chance to attack you, or jump over his projectile, get over to him and take him out before he's able to hit you with it. And it's one of those ones where you're on certain jumps, you'll think you'll be able to make it in time, but what happens is you end up getting knocked back right into the pit, and you end up uh, losing one of your lives. This is also the first time we have to deal really a lot with the eagles on these platforms. Now we had to deal with them a little bit before, but this is where they start to get really annoying. The eagles are, in my opinion, the worst enemy of the Ninja Gaiden trilogy on the NES. Because they come at you, and if, even if you jump over them, you can't actually, uh, actually hit them, or kill them, they then come right back at you. 
and they just keep repeating kind of like a boomerang over and over again until you actually take them out, or when they go to one side, move off screen so that they are taken off screen for a second and they'll just disappear and be gone. Now here's the first boss battle where I'm going to use my clones to my advantage. I jumped up and I'm able to hit the boss repeatedly, and every time you do damage to